This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by Verve. With Verve, you can now binge all of your favorite Nickelodeon shows of the 90s, so stay tuned after the video to find out more. And click on the link in the description so you can start an ad-free 30-day trial of Verve Premium, or go to vrv.co slash yesterworld. While Hanna-Barbera and Nickelodeon are from two different eras of cartoons, they're closely associated with each other when it comes to now-abandoned theme park attractions. So let's explore five Hanna-Barbera and Nickelodeon attractions and how they came to reside in Yesterworld. magic on the map. Alton Towers. In your dreams, you're already there. In 1995, the United Kingdom's theme park Alton Towers saw the closure of the Talbot Tea Shop and Dolls Museum. A short time later, they made a deal with Nickelodeon to replace the former exhibit with an experience called the Nickelodeon Mind Maze. This was later changed to Nickelodeon Out of Control, which was named after a 1980s sketch comedy show that aired on Nickelodeon. Well, Masa, we found that Hama Sushi is without a doubt the world's best sushi, and we'd like to present you with this Out of Control Let's Eat Award for having the world's best sushi. The attraction was originally supposed to open in 1996, but due to technical difficulties, it was pushed to June of the following year. Nickelodeon Out of Control was essentially a funhouse slash maze, where groups of about 20 to 30 would travel from room to room and experience the various activities. Many of them were intended for children and involved making noise, playing with random objects, or having their shadows freeze on the wall. To reach the end, adults went down the stairs, with kids making their way across a bridge and going down a slide. In the final room, visitors were shown highlights of their experiences, as captured by hidden cameras throughout the attraction. They could then exit through either a gift shop named Off the Shelf or a cafe named Burp and Slurp. Nickelodeon Out of Control received mixed to poor reviews, and some felt it was less of an attraction and more of a way to advertise the television network. It was never much of a success, and it was closed the following year, with much of its exterior being left unchanged when the frog hopper was placed out front. Nearly a decade later, the Slurp and Burp Cafe, as well as Off the Shelf, briefly reopened during a Halloween event. It's also during this time that a series of behind-the-scenes tours offered a glimpse inside the former attraction, much of which still remained intact. And though the buildings are mostly used for storage space, it's believed these Nickelodeon elements still exist today. If you hear the phrase Yabba Dabba Do, chances are you instantly think of The Flintstones, a Hanna-Barbera produced animated sitcom which first debuted in 1960. Unlike Hanna-Barbera's other programs, The Flintstones was initially created to draw in a more adult audience. It became an instant hit and was the first to be nominated for a primetime Emmy. Well, a guy's due for a beer. Bush does it. You can't say beer better, Fred. During the Flintstones' final season in 1966, a theme park slash trailer park opened in Custer, South Dakota. However, calling Bedrock City a theme park is a bit of a stretch, but it did feature costume characters, exhibits, a theater, and a cafe. While the park was popular, it suffered from one major problem. The winter months saw a decline in visitors for long periods of time. With its seasonal popularity, one of the founders left South Dakota to build a second location near the Grand Canyon, which officially opened in 1972. Hey gang, get your very own dinosaur operator's license when you visit Bedrock. We'll teach you everything you need to know to become an expert dinosaur operator. <laughs> During the 1970s, two additional privately owned locations were founded in British Columbia, Canada, one in Chilliwack and another in Kelowna. That Power Ranger obsessed kid is me, as my family visited the Chilliwack location during my childhood. Looking back, it was a bit cheesy, but you can't put a price on the happiness of a child. Yeesh. Well, that is kind of creepy. Anyways, the sale of Hanna-Barbera to Turner Broadcasting in the 90s caused a war over the licensing rights. Turner Broadcasting demanded huge amounts of money, and ultimately forced the Canadian locations to close. Both were torn down, but one became a generic dinosaur-themed tourist destination until 2010. You can meet the Flintstones for some modern Stone Age fun at Flintstones Bedrock City. See Mount Rockmore, 
and enjoy the Rock and Flintstones Trio Show. Then romp on the prehistoric playground, enjoy some Flintstone food, and shop for unique Flintstone items in the gift shop. The North America locations fared better, but while the South Dakota location kept up refurbishments, the Arizona location did not. By the early 2000s, the park was only a shadow of its former self, losing many of the activities and costume characters. The South Dakota location was recently sold to new owners, but its future remains unclear as it's currently not operational. However, in 2016, thanks to the power of the internet, the Canadian park's iconic 40-foot Fred Flintstone billboard was spotted on Google Earth. When the news broke, the previous owner of the park said he intends to chop up the billboard into pieces and sell them as memorabilia. Even today, the Arizona location still operates 364 days a year. Currently, the park's owners are trying to sell the property for $2 million, so for now, visit the last remaining and technically operating Flintstones Park while you still can. When Universal Studios Florida officially opened to the public, one of the park's day one attractions was the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera. However, despite its popularity in the early to mid-90s, by 1998, Universal observed that the attraction was no longer pulling in a large audience. Evidently, kids were becoming more and more disinterested in Hanna-Barbera, so work began in secret on the attraction's replacement, and in 2012, the attraction was permanently closed. In its place would be a new experience based on Jimmy Neutron and other Nickelodeon cartoons, later revealed as Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blast, but if only they decided to use his original character design. Hi, I'm Johnny Quasar, and this is my robot dog, Goddard. Bark, bark. The outside of the attraction remained mostly unchanged, and the Hanna-Barbera clips within the queue were of course replaced by Nickelodeon. However, the pre-show was drastically changed, with Jimmy Neutron unveiling his newest invention, the Mark IV rocket. The Mark IV is a triumphant rocket engineering. It's the fastest, strongest rocket ever built. When it's stolen by Ublar, Jimmy and Carl decide to follow him in the Mark II rocket with the audience proceeding to board the less reliable Mark I. The ride itself was incredibly similar to Hanna-Barbera, where you'd travel through the world and bump into characters of the studio's creations. This time, however, you'd travel through the Nickelodeon universe that included virtually every show from the popular television network. The specific worlds featured were the Rugrats neighborhood and a trip through Tommy Pickle's house. Fairy World from the Fairly Odd Parents, Bikini Bottom from SpongeBob SquarePants, and of course, Jimmy Neutron. The ride ends with Ublar defeated and a bunch of llamas. Llama, 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 llama. What? Thanks for helping me save the universe. Got a blast! Also like Hanna-Barbera, the post-show featured various activities and photo opportunities, as well as a Nickelodeon-themed gift shop. Reviews for Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blasts were mostly positive, though some felt it was geared a bit too much towards children. For those who truly missed Hanna-Barbera, for a short time around 2006, variations of the attractions could be found within the Paramount-owned theme parks, such as Canada's Wonderland, as well as Mall of America, and even Dollywood. In 2011, Universal announced that Jimmy Neutron would operate on a seasonal basis, until permanently closing that August. It was later announced that the third incarnation of the attraction would revolve around the massively popular Despicable Me. The Despicable Me attraction will completely transform the experience that is now in the space of Jimmy Neutron at Universal Studios Florida. Though virtually all of the traces of the ride's predecessors were removed, there's still a few nods to the originals. In Despicable Me Minion Mayhem, the use of the iconic Nickelodeon orange and green slime are possible references. More concrete is when you reach the anti-gravity chamber, as if you look closely, you can spot the rocket featured in Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blast. A little bit later, you can spot another rocket that's a tribute to the one featured in the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera. In the gift shop, you can also spot a seemingly out-of-place rocket, but it just so happens to be a tribute to the Nickelodeon rocket that was once displayed in its former gift shop. During a time that many refer to as the theme park boom, the $300 million King's Island opened to the public in 1972, and its most expensive attraction by far was Hanna-Barbera's Enchanted Voyage. Music 
Located within the happy land of Hanna-Barbera, Enchanted Voyage was a boat ride very similar to It's a Small World, as visitors were taken through a series of rooms featuring the characters and worlds of Hanna-Barbera. Also like It's a Small World, the ride featured a catchy musical theme based off the ones featured in the various cartoons. Long, long ago, deep in the forest, there was a hidden village where tiny creatures lived. They call themselves Smurfs. However, with the success of the Smurfs in the 80s, the boat ride was transformed into the Smurfs Enchanted Voyage in 1984, and the redesigned boat ride featured new animatronics and a much more cohesive experience, as you were taken through their various seasons and holidays. In a theme park rarity, many considered the Smurfs an even better experience than its predecessor. However, in 1991, the ride was gutted to make way for a brand new experience. The mystery of the Phantom Theater awaits you through that door. <laughs> Phantom Manor was a not-so-subtle ripoff of Disney's The Haunted Mansion, down to featuring the same Omnimover ride vehicle system. The attraction was essentially a behind-the-scenes tour of a haunted opera house, featuring many of Disney's trademarks used in The Haunted Mansion. You have come too far. You have seen too much. In 2003, the attraction was given another makeover and transformed into Scooby-Doo and the Haunted Castle, only this time it would be a dark ride slash shooter, not unlike Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin. Finally, the ride saw its last transformation in 2010, into Boo Blasters on Boo Hill. I initially attempted to make this final segment a sort of history of the Hanna-Barbera and Nickelodeon attractions in the Cedar Fair parks. But as they span over six different theme parks, 30 plus years, and three company buyouts, I was beginning to go mad tying it all together. So instead, I picked my five favorite abandoned attractions of Hanna-Barbera Land and Nickelodeon Central. King's Mill Log Flume opened at King's Island in 1972, with another incarnation appearing in Carowinds the next year. For Nickelodeon Central, these were both rethemed as the Wild Thornberry's River Adventure, which was actually quite an extensive retheming given the nature of these rides. King's Island's version was later changed to Race for Your Life Charlie Brown, and Carowind's version was demolished entirely for a new roller coaster called the Intimidator. Though not part of the King's Entertainment Company slash Paramount-owned parks, a Matterhorn-styled attraction named Avalanche opened in Dreamworld in 1983. When Dreamworld also gained Nickelodeon Central, it was rethemed to the Angry Beavers and called the Spooty Spin. In 2011, the coaster returned to its former theming, and was demolished in 2012 to make way for the Kung Fu Panda-based attraction, Pandemonium. Flintstone's Boulder Bumpers was a day one attraction at King's Island in 1983. There's not much to it, but I love these little mini versions of the iconic Flintstones vehicles. With Nickelodeon Central, it was then transformed into Jimmy Neutron's Atom Smasher, and it now resides as Joe Cool's Dodgem School. Originally opening as the Land of the Dews Mine Train at King's Dominion, the coaster was later transformed into Smurf Mountain. The coaster shared very similar show scenes and set pieces to its sister attraction the Smurfs Village over at King's Island. In the late 90s, it was closed to make way for a new attraction called Volcano the Blast Coaster. Fred's Splashdown opened in the land of Bedrock in Australia's Wonderland in 1993, and it's probably the best example of a truly abandoned attraction, In a topic for a future video. In a nutshell, Australia's Wonderland wasn't included in Paramount's acquisition of the King's Entertainment theme parks. After years of neglect and poor attendance, the later renamed Wonderland Sydney was permanently closed in 2004. Even today, among the scattered remnants of the park's other attractions, you can still find traces of Fred's Splashdown, making this the truest example of an abandoned attraction. Honorable mentions include Runaway Reptar, which turned into Snoopy vs. the Red Baron, and Nickelodeon's Pipeline Plunge, the last of the Nickelodeon Blast Zone slash Hotel Water Parks. If you enjoyed the video, I'm gonna assume you're a fan of Nickelodeon, and go even further and say you have fond memories of their cartoons of the 90s. Personally, I was addicted to shows like Kenan and Kel, 
Doug, Legends of the Hidden Temple, okay, pretty much every show on Nickelodeon. With Verve, you can now fill your nostalgia cravings with Nixplat, where you can binge through all of your favorites. But Verve has way more to offer than just Nickelodeon, and it has something for just about everyone. Fan of animes like Dragon Ball Super or Attack on Titan? They have it, with or without dubs. Love documentaries? They have that too. Can't get enough of the Nerdist? You get the idea. Best of all, you can download the app on your favorite devices and watch your favorite shows on the go, both online and offline. So to get started, just click on the link in the description to start your 30-day ad-free trial of Verve Premium today, or go to vrv.co slash yesterworld. And to avoid missing out on future content, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if you want to help support the making of future videos, check out my Patreon and shop in the description. And as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Yesterworld.